morning. So good morning, everybody. Today we are going to be finishing up our discussion on fluid transfer equipment. Um, on Tuesday, we talked about pipes, tubes, valves, and we got into a discussion on pumps as well as pump and system curves. Today, we're going to finish our discussion of pump and system curves as well as talk about uh, compressible flow uh, transfer equipment and do some equations for calculating uh, operational parameters for uh, compressors and such. And so from last time, we had been looking at pump and system curves. No, why it defaults to red. And we said for a given pump curve, it follows that the head of pump would add is a function that follows this form, a minus b times v squared for a system curve. and follows a similar form, c plus d times v dot squared, such that if we graphed a pump and system curve where the x-axis was flow rate, the y-axis was head, we would find the pump curve would look something like this, and the system curve would look a little like this. And the intersection would be known as the point of operation. Meaning if I put that pump in line in that fluid transfer system, it would operate at this flow rate, I have denoted V naught, and the pump would apply a particular head delta H naught. And I left you all with a question that asked, how can we operate outside of the point of operation? So, we typically want to have a little more flexibility in our fluid transfer systems beyond just a single point. So what are some of the things, what's the, what can we do to have more flexibility in our fluid transfer system? What are your thoughts? Any ideas? All right. Well, what we can do is through the use of valves, we can modify our operation to allow variable flow rates. And so we talked a little bit how valves increase the head loss that we experience in our fluid transfer system. And so what that means is with a valve, instead of having to operate upon a single point, we can actually operate anywhere in this region. So operation region. Anywhere where the pump 
curve is above the system curve. And so if I would rather operate, let's see here, at V sub one, the head required would be this value. The head that the pump would add to the fluid would be this value. And so you would set up a valve or a valve system where you would see a head loss of that value. And so you essentially just use valves to deal with the excess energy. Now you'll notice that that's a lot of energy waste, so it's not going to be an efficient means of operation by any means, but if that's the flow rate you desire, that's a way of getting um, essentially flow rates beyond that single point of operation. And so what that means is this point actually denotes the maximum point of operation for a given pump and a given system. One thing I do like to note is that this pump curve, or the pump curve I've stated above, only applies to centrifugal pumps. If you look at peristaltic pumps or positive displacement pumps, you'll note that the pump curve for those is going to be extremely narrow in terms of flow rate. And so you're not going to have very any flexibility, if at all, in terms of the flow rates that you can have with a, with a positive displacement pump. But for a centrifugal pump, you were gonna see that quadratic relation. And so you're gonna get a much wider um, space of operation. Any questions on pumps and system curves? All right, let's take a look at an example. So this example, we have a uh, system curve already provided that says for a given fluid transfer system, the system curved can be expressed with the following delta H equals 25 plus 0 0.0011 times Q squared, where Q is the flow rate in gallons per minute. And if the pump from figure 810 is going to be used, what impeller speed should be used at that flow rate? And based on that, what is the expected efficiency and power for the pump? So we have a delta H of 25 plus 0 0.0011 times Q squared. And we have an impeller speed that we need to find based off of a flow rate of 180 gallons per minute. So based on that, we need to find delta H when Q is 180. So based on this, when our flow rate is 180 gallons per minute, what is our delta H? Well, I get a value of approximately 60.6 .6 feet. So based on this, we can go back to that figure. I put it here. 
So we're looking for the intersection of 180 gallons per minute and 60.6 .6 feet. So we find in this case, the impeller speed we can use is approximately 2,880 RPM. The efficiency is about 79%, which we see these efficiency curves, which are a little tricky to read, but we do the best we can. And the power is going to be somewhere between three horsepower, which we see these lines for power, and five horsepower. So based off where we see it in terms of those lines, I would estimate that to be around 3.5 horsepower for the power consumption. Does everyone kind of understand how I was able to obtain those points? I'm looking at the intersection between 180 and 60. So it would be somewhere right about here. A quick question. Yes. So with the delta H equation, you just plugged in um, 180 gallons per minute for the vol volumetric flow rate. Mm -hmm. That just automatically give you the right units of the head, or do you have to do conversions with that? In, in a typical problem, you do have to do conversions. Okay. The way I, was shaving gallons per minute. Yeah, I, there was a lot of hand waving minutes. in this example. That, okay. That's where those um, constants came from. Okay. In terms of the conversions were already kind of baked in there. But for an actual problem, I'll admit this is a very, very simplified um, example. In a typical problem, you would have to solve the mechanical energy balance to obtain that delta H equation. So okay. you're going to have to do some, you know, algebraic manipulation to replace all the flow velocities with flow rates. And, you know, that, that's a good question, primarily because I don't think in this class um, we've talked about how we can get to this expression from the mechanical energy balance. Um, so just kind of a quick recap, the answer, my pen will work. I wish I knew why it does that. Hold on, it's probably because. So it was 2,880 RPM. The, that was the impeller speed, the efficiency was approximately 79%, and the power was approximately 3.5 horsepower. So yeah, you brought up the, a good point, Jacob. We never really talked in terms about system curves and how we can get to that expression. And so going back to the mechanical energy balance, if I write my expression in terms of fluid head, I can get obtain this expression, correct? All right. So work over G is my delta H, which is equal to this system plus delta U squared over 2G plus H sub L. I'm writing it in this form for a couple of reasons. One, when I consider my system curve via the mechanical energy balance and factors that are a function of flow rate and factors that are independent of flow rate. I often find that my pressure energy and my static energy, my static head, my pressure head are independent of flow rate. However, my velocity head and my head loss are a function of flow rate. And so these two terms typically become that first initial constant A or C that we've talked about in this second grouping becomes that additional second constant where, where I can see where, you know, V dot is equal to U times A, which is equal times pi U D squared over four. So I can rearrange this, right? And I can say U is equal to four V dot over pi D squared. So by plugging in essentially 
this term for everywhere that velocity shows up and most of my velocity had in my head loss, I can obtain an expression in terms of my flow rate. And those terms will be a function of flow rate squared, right? Because we have a square in the velocity head and in head loss. And so that's where this expression of the form comes in. Now, if you want, you can probably on your, uh, look at, you know, how rearranging, you know, the big friction equation, KE, KC, KF, this would be u squared over 2g, right? So by plugging in essentially where the u's are for v dot, hopefully you kind of see where this v flow rate squared times some constant comes in. And so we essentially have pressure head and static head, which is independent of the flow rate, and then the velocity head and the head loss, which is going to be dependent on the flow rate squared. And it's oftentimes when we look at pump and system curves, this intercept for the system curve is going to be that A value. And when there's no pressure differential that we see over the system, a lot of time that's just the static head. So if I'm just trying to get my fluid from A to B and I'm not getting a, a net pressure change, that intercept will sim simply be the static head. And then essentially values beyond that is gonna be a combination of the head loss as well as um, the velocity head. So this would be you know, your B term, right? So does that kind of make sense in that explanation? I say it because these are some good questions that I like to ask on midterms and finals. So I, I feel it's worth taking the time to kind of break down how we can come up with this uh, system curve expression in the proper form. Yeah, and so you're gonna have a lot of unit conversions and things associated with the constants A and B, right? Because A is gonna be in the form of what? This unit should be feet by the end of it. This is going to be a flow rate squared. So if I had, let's say, my flow rate in cubic feet per minute, my V squared is going to be, or second, this would be, you know, cubic feet squared, so feet to the sixth over seconds, or second squared. So the units of B need to be second squared to over feet to the fifth when you do the unit conversions assuming your delta H is in feet. Yes. Uh, is that for the pump or system curve? Because this for the, is the pump system curve. you define everything negative, like A minus B. Yeah, this would be the system curve. The pump so, curve would be okay. would be A minus B. Okay, so would that be C and D then, or does it not really matter? It really doesn't matter, they're just constants. If okay. you want, I can I can change it all to C and D, but they're, they're just constants for okay. any given system. So yeah, so does that, is that explanation clear or is there still some confusion? Yes or no? Yeah, that helped. Did it? Anyone confused or have questions? No questions? Okay, then we can keep moving. So the next thing we, I wanted to discuss is the transportation of gases or the fluid transfer equipment associated with compressible fluids. So gases are transported using one of three different types of systems. We have fans, blowers, and compressors. Fans are typically used to transport large volumes of 
of compressible fluid. And it's important to note that we're not concerned with any sort of delta P. We're really not trying to apply any, any pressure to the fluid. We're really just trying to move you know, a large body of fluid from point A to point B or keep things properly mixed when it, when it comes to uh, uh, gases. Now blowers are typically used when you want to transport gases at high velocities. And you, you might expect to see a moderate pressure change to enable the, the high velocity you'd like to obtain in a blower. And the more important piece of equipment that we have to consider lies in compressors. That's the purpose of a compressor is to increase the pressure of, of a compressible fluid. This is going to be the workhorse associated with process engineering and operations. Right, so we can we can see pretty sizable changes um, in the head applied for the fluids as it relates to the delta P in our systems. And, and these pressures are going to be on the orders anywhere between one and a thousand atmospheres depending on the compressor type and how we operate them. Dr. Lopez, you said one and a thousand atmospheres, but you wrote them two to a thousand. Do you mean, which one do you mean? One to a thousand. So when it comes to compressors, we're interested in considering two forms of operation. The first one we're going to look at is isentropic compression. This is our idealized system. And one thing that's important to note when we talk about compressors, especially, is that increasing our pressure often results in an increased temperature. And for a given system, we can calculate that temperature change by the following expression. Tb is equal to Pb over Pa times 1 minus 1 over gamma. This should look a little familiar. We used it and we were discussing a compressible flow. However, it's very rare that we end up with isentropic compression. Oftentimes we're interested in, well, when the, the system is irreversible, what's the work associated with essentially compressing our fluid? So we can consider both adiabatic and isothermal compression. And so for adiabatic compression, we find that the work is equal to our initial pressure PA times our gamma divided by gamma minus one. over rho A, or the density of the fluid initially, times our, that pressure ratio, PB over PA, times one minus one over gamma minus one. And then for isothermal compression,
And once again, you know, this is Q equals zero. And this is T is constant. The work associated with isothermal compression can be R times the T divided by molecular weight times the natural log of the pressure ratio. Once again, keeping in mind, this is that compressure ratio. Any questions on that? Yeah, the first equation for the isotropic compression, did you have a, um, okay, yeah, I didn't see the, uh, the power that it was raised to. Thank yeah, you. This, this P might be in the whale. So yeah, that's the exponent one minus one over gamma. That's fair. So one thing that we also have to consider is as I stated earlier, increasing the pressure of the gas will result in an increased temperature. And so the question that comes up is, how do we regulate temperatures? as we compress. A gas, All right? Because we increase the pressure, the temperature increases fairly dramatically. So how do you suppose we have this occur or operate these systems to maintain a reasonable temperature? Well, the most effective thing that we can consider is the design of what's known as interstaging cooling. And so two things typically happen. One, we can operate a compressor system as a multi-stage compressor system, where instead of having one large compressor, we limit our pressure ratio between the inlet and outlet of a single compressor uh, to a certain value. You typically don't want a compressor, compression ratio above, definitely above four, most often than not, you're, you're somewhere in the order of two and three for your compressor ratio, compression ratio. And so what that means is you, you only compress your uh, fluid to a certain level, then to adjust for the increased temperature, you put it through a heat exchanger. However, what can happen is you can have condensables within your gas stream. Let's say you're, you know, you're compressing air with some reasonable humidity. As you compress that gas and then cool it, you might see liquid formation. And just like pumps that you don't want any vapor in it, for compressors, you don't want any uh, liquid in it either. And so what you can do is you have the presence of these knockout drums, which separates and ensures there's no liquid um, entering your compressors. So then you have essentially this design here where you have multi-stage compression with interstage cooling after each compression as well as knockout drums to ensure there's no liquid in your vapor stream. And so with that in mind, when we consider multi-stage compression, we're often considering, well, what's one, how many compression stages are needed given a desired outlet based on an inlet pressure and what will be the compression compressor ratio, I'm sorry, I'm, 
stumbling over that word, the compressor ratio for each stage. Well, that can be calculated for one stage where we have PB over PA for a single stage as the nth root of your desired outlet pressure based off your inlet pressure, where N is the number of compression stages. I can't see a screen if you're writing. Just okay, I'll right. bring it back. Thank you. So for, you know, keep this in mind, this, there is a homework problem on multi-stage compression. So you have to consider how many compression stages and based off that, you can identify the compression ratio for each stage. Because the, the work that you put in will be minimized if the compression ratio is the same for all stages. So with that in mind, let's work a couple examples. Hold on, Dr. Lopez. Does CR1 stand for compression ratio, compression ratio 1? It's just the compression ratio of a single stage. And is that the nth root of P out over Pn? Yes. All right, so let's take a look at a couple examples. I might have you do the first one and screw groups and we'll talk about it. So let's say for a fan, we're be using it to transport flue gas from a combustion reactor to a scrubber system. If the inlet pressure is 29 inches of mercury with a temperature of 200 degrees Fahrenheit, the discharge pressure is reading slightly higher, 30.1 inches of mercury, with a gas velocity of 150 feet per second. Can we estimate the power required to move 10,000 standard cubic feet per minute of this gas? Assuming the efficiency of the fan is 70% and the molecular weight of the gas is 31.3 grams per mole. So for this system, you can, we can probably assume incompressible fluid expressions will provide a reasonable estimate. We can apply the mechanical energy balance to the system to identify the work and the power that's desired. So I'm gonna give you a head and give you guys maybe four or five minutes. We were a little ahead of schedule today to do this calculation in some breakouts. And then we'll talk about the solution as a class. So join when you're ready.
All right. How did the problem go? Was any group able to get to a reasonable answer? Or make some progress? No one? We can, do we start with ice thermal compression equation? With this, this is a fan, and the pressure, com the pressure added is very negligible. So we can actually just use the um, incompressible flow equations. So what we're really looking for is work as it applies within our typical mechanical energy balance. So this is what we're solving for. So in this system, we don't have anything associated with friction because the pressure drop is provided based off of the inlet and outlet pressure on the fan. And there's no discussion of any static head requirements in the problem statement. So what we're looking for for the work and eventually for the power which is the mass flow rate times work over efficiency, is the pressure head and the velocity head to be applied to this gas by the fan. And so to solve for our pressure, And we actually, the pressure, the pressure is given. So PN was what? Twenty-nine inches of mercury. P out given was thirty point one inches of mercury. And we need to know the density of this gas. Well, to find the density of the gas, we have to use the ideal gas law. And we can do this one of two ways. We can find the density at each point, or we can solve for an average density. Based off of the information provided, in the problem statement. And so, the, let's see. The inlet pressure provided was 39 inches of mercury, which for simplicity, I'd probably wanna convert that to PSI. So that gives us a pressure for one of approximately, and I'll just write it down here, 14.24 PSI. And then for the other 30.1, we got about 14.78. PSI. So if I do this math, 14.24 PSI times the molecular weight, which is 31.3 pounds per pound mole, divided by R, which I'm going to use 10.73 PSI cubic feet per pound mole degree R. 
the temperature provided was 200 degrees Fahrenheit or 660 Rankin. So doing this, the density comes out to be about 0 0.063 pounds per cubic feet. If I look at my second density, I got 14.78 PSI times 31.3 pounds per pound mole over 10.73 PSI cubic feet per pound mole degree R divided by 660. Then I get a density of approximately 0 0.0654 pounds per cubic feet. And so the average density, which is just a ratio of the densities, is about 0 0.0642 pound mass per cubic feet. So now with that in mind, I can identify the pressure differential of the pressure head in this problem, or my delta P over rho term, it's going to be 14.78 PSI minus 14.24 PSI. I multiply that times G sub D, 32.2 pound mass feet Oh, sorry, multiply, not divide. Pound force, second squared. I multiply that times 144 inches squared per feet squared. And then I divide by my density, 0 0.0642 pound mass per foot cubed. I do this calculation. And I get approximately 39,001 feet squared per second squared. And if I want it in a different unit, I get 1,211 foot pound force per pound mass, so depending on the units that we want them in. So what we need next is our velocity head, which we had as 150 feet per second was our velocity. So our velocity head, is simply u squared over 2, or 150 feet per second squared over 2. Which ends up being 3,750 feet squared per second squared, or Mistake. Hold on. Should be eleven thousand two hundred and fifty, or approximately three hundred and forty-nine point four foot pound force per pound mass. So now I have my two terms associated with my work. I can then solve for the work that is done by the fan, which is approximately 
50,251 feet squared per second squared. Or if I wanted in foot pound force per pound mass, I got approximately 1,560. Point four foot pound force per pound mass. So with that in mind, I can then consider how to solve for power. I have my work, my efficiency was given. It was approximately 70%. So I need to solve for my mass flow rate. Well, I know my volumetric flow rate is 10,000 standard cubic feet per minute. And I have my density. as 0 0.0642 pound mass per cubic feet. And so my mass flow rate should be approximately 10,000 cubic feet per minute times my 0 0.0642 pound mass per cubic feet divided by 60. I get about 10.7 pounds per second. So now with this in mind, I can solve for my power. That's 10.7 pound mass per second times my work, which is approximately 1,560 foot pounds per pound mass divided by 0.7 and divided by 550 foot pound force per second per horsepower. So with that, you got an approximate Any questions on that? If not, we'll look at one more example. This one for a compressor. So in this day system, I have a three stage reciprocating compressor used to compress 180 standard cubic feet per minute of methane going from 14 PSI up to 900 PSI. The inlet temperature was identified at 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And what is the power if the efficiency of a compressor is 80%? And what would be the discharge temperature of the first stage? a couple seconds to write this stuff down.
All right, so let's take a look at this problem. So my inlet pressure is 14 PSI. My outlet pressure is 900 PSI. My inlet temperature is 80 degrees Fahrenheit, which is approximately 540 degrees Rankin. And my flow rate is 180 standard cubic feet per minute of methane. So we're looking at methane. And for methane, the gamma value is 1.31. So we have to figure out the power and the discharge temperature of the first stage. So for this system, the first thing we need to figure out is the compression ratio of a single stage as the problem identifies it as a three stage system. So the compression ratio of a single stage is gonna be the nth root of the outlet pressure, 900 PSI, over the inlet pressure, 14 PSI. So I'm looking for the cube root of 900 over 14, which should be 0.4. Just at about four. So this is going to be my compression ratio for each stage. And I can solve for the power Fortunately, there is an expression provided in the text. And it's 1.304 times 10 to the minus four times the initial temperature times the initial volume divided by the efficiency of the compressor times gamma or gamma minus one times our compression ratio of our single stage over one over one minus gamma minus one. And this is equation 820B, page 221 in your text. So fortunately, we have everything we need to plug in and solve for the power. One thing you have to be careful with is that you're using proper units because of the presence of this 1.304 times 10 to the minus four term. So plugging in all the values that I have, I can identify and solve for my power as a simple kind of plug and chug operation. Doing that calculation, I get a power value of approximately 26 horsepower. Now this is the power for a single stage. For all three stage, I need to identify the total power. And that's just simply the 26 horsepower times three stages, or a power of approximately 78 horsepower.
to solve for my outlet temperature. I can use this expression that we had earlier. And so what I'm left with is TB over TA equals four times one minus one over 1.31, which equals approximately, let's see. One point three eight eight. And so TB is going to be one point three eight eight times TA, which we had five hundred and forty Rankin. So we get seven hundred and fifty Rankin. which converting that to Fahrenheit, we get approximately 290 degrees Fahrenheit for our outlet temperature, and that's of a single stage. Any questions? I see a couple in the chat. Uh, Mitch asks, is brake horsepower the same as horsepower or power is it stopping power? That's a good question. For, for all intents and purposes for what we're looking at, it's, it's essentially going to be the powers applied to the gas as a versus the power applied to the compressor itself. So sometimes you'll see that break horsepower, but for, for all intents and purposes for us, that's just what's the power applied to the fluid. And in this case, the methane. And in terms of how do we get horsepower, it's, there's no real easy way to say how, it's essentially just how the equation is written on page 221, provided you use the units for temperature, it has to be in Rankin, your flow rate has to be in standard cubic feet per minute, um, the equation will output horsepower because the essential unit conversion is done for you. That's why there's a 1.304 times 10 to the minus four um, constant in the expression. So there will be a little bit of homework using some of these expressions. Um, any other questions? One last thing I do want to talk about, as it will be important for your homework, um, is considerations for pumps in series and parallel. as it relates to pumps and system curves. Now, if I have a system with just a single pump, for any given flow rate, I can expect some head to be added to the fluid by the pump, right? And this head added is gonna follow the pump curve expression or the form of a, what we expect to see for a pump curve, assuming it's a centrifugal pump. Now, if I have two pumps in series, this is, what I find is that each of these pumps is gonna apply the same head to the fluid, 
as I have for that same particular flow rate, the head's going to be added now twice. And so when I'm looking at the system in series, my flow rate for any given flow rate, as compared to the single pump case, my flow rates will be the same. However, the head added can be considered N times delta H single, where N is the number of pumps in series. And if I'm looking at a parallel pumps, it gets a little different. Now for any given flow rate, that flow will split And, and now I can expect some head to be added, but I'm not sure what head would be added. I know it will be higher if the flow rate is half, but I can't say for sure, as compared to my single or series case, what that head will be. But in this case, if I double my flow rate, now each pump, we'll see that initial flow, V, and I can say, well, if it sees that initial flow rate, the fluid will experience an increase in head delta H, which is the same as what it saw in the single pump case. And so what I can say in parallel, the head added would be the same as it would be in a single pump if the volumetric flow rate of parallel is increased as compared to the single case times N, where N is the number of pumps in parallel. And so this will be very useful as you work uh, your homework as you'll have to do some data manipulation to consider how to correct for pumps and series in parallel. And so if I was gonna draw on that pump curve chart where my x-axis is my flow rate, my y-axis is delta H, I could say for any given pump curve that follows this form, here I'll try to make it a little cleaner. If I consider pumps in series, say two pumps in series, my pump curve will have the same bounds of flow rate, but at every point, the flow rate will be doubled. So it'll look a little like this. And for pumps in parallel, it'll have the same bounds in terms of head applied but the flow rates will be doubled. So if I plot a system curve that looks like this, you can see how comparison in terms of pumps and series and parallel modifies our realm of operation. So you have a homework problem that basically asks you to do this. Based on a pump and system curve, redraw one for series and parallel and compare the points of operation. Any questions on that? Any questions on anything that we've discussed associated with fluid transfer equipment?
All right, if not, that's about all I have.